Thank you, Professor Gould. Next up is Professor Howard Hayden. Professor Hayden is a Colorado native. He earned his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree in physics from the University of Denver. He spent 32 years at the University of Connecticut doing accelerator-based research. We've got some fans, it's great, and teaching physics. He took early retirement and headed back to Colorado. He writes a monthly newsletter, The Energy Advocate, picked up my copy. He's the author of The Solar Fraud, Why Solar Energy Won't Run the World, as well as A Primer on CO2 and Climate, both in their second editions. He is currently working on a third book commissioned by the Science and Public Policy Institute, tentatively titled A Teacher and Student Guide to Climate Science. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hayden. Thank you for coming to hear this uh, humble talk and uh, my great thanks to the um, Heartland Institute for running such a fine program uh, with the possible present exception. Um, <coughs> I, I'm not going to be talking a, a whole lot about climate science here. I'm going to be talking about the uh, propaganda effort uh, that is uh, ongoing. Propaganda? What propaganda? Um, last year, uh, I looked at, out my window and saw that there was something going on there at Times Square. Uh, the most expensive billboard in the world is right there at Times Square with ball drops on, uh, on uh, New Year's. And there was something going on there. Um, <clears throat> you can't read this thing. I took a picture, I, well, it's actually a movie, and I took uh, this, these pictures uh, that are somewhat low resolution because I had just gotten this camera and it was sort of set, factory set for low resolution. But it, what shows there is uh, Beijing, China, in some year like, I can't read that thing, 2027, um, uh, under desert sands. And the next one shows the Amazon rainforest uh, in Brazil, 2000 something or another. Uh, the following one shows Wembley Stadium under ocean water at some other date in the future. Um, now I got news for you folks. If you haven't seen it, it's going on right now. Uh, <clears throat> full time, I called up to find out uh, what does it cost to run an ad there? And it's about 700,000 bucks a month um, to run full time, and, and this thing ran about quarter time, perhaps. So you can begin to see there's some big money behind this propaganda campaign. Here's the solution they're offering out, by the way. This comes blaring out at you with bright flashes in between to make sure you get the word, find out what you can do, and then you go to a website. So I thought, well, that's a big pile of money, and I got home from this thing, and I found out that, uh, Al Gore had, in, had uh, started a $300 million, in quotes, advertising blitz, which could best be called a propaganda campaign. Is there any possibility that somebody has something to gain by spending all this money? Or are they doing it uh, just for their own uh, uh, self-gratification? They just do it for fun, sure, right. Uh, <clears throat> Brett Anderson has a nice thing here uh, where he, he, he has uh, Al Gore there saying that the uh, anti-global warming skeptics are a tiny, tiny majority or, or minority and that's all 32,000 of us. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> here's the head Goron. Um, it's, uh, this is in his documentacity called uh, An Inconvenient Truth. He says, now I'm going to show you recently released the actual temperatures. Yeah, I mean, he ain't English up too good. <coughs> <laughs> so he shows this picture here. Now, you might have seen something very similar to this yesterday uh, in um, uh, Art Robinson's talk. Uh, he didn't show you quite far enough into the film, as far as I can see. But he had, here's this uh, graph of 
nothing versus nothing, as far as I can say. There's no scales, no time scale, no temperature scale, but he does say it's a temperature scale. But if you go back to the, the graph that uh, Art had shown up yesterday, you can actually figure out what the time scale is, and I'm putting the time scale on for you, okay? It's nice to have actual temperature data from 2020. I mean, it, it gores into retroactive causality. <coughs> he's, uh, he, he's working on a morning after pill for men. <laughs> Sorry, honey, I'll take a pill in the morning. Uh, and if it doesn't work, he might commit posthumous suicide. <laughs> now, <clears throat> here is a graph of uh, the temperature as measured by satellite uh, since they began on December 1978. You can put a, I mean, some people just put a straight line through there, and that's, well, that's very easy to do because uh, the uh, Excel will readily put through a um, trend line. Um, actually, uh, there's no reason for having any trend line at all. I mean, there's, trends are utterly meaningless, okay? But anyway, I put a fourth order fit through the, a fourth order polynomial through the data, uh, which has no predictive value whatsoever. Trends have no predictive value whatsoever. But I put through this fourth order fit. Uh, now, fourth order polynomial could have uh, three curvatures, like uh, uh, one upward curvature and a downward curvature and an upward curvature, or it could be uh, one like this, followed by one like this, followed by one like that. That's what it allows for, and uh, it would allow for um, uh, uh, two points of inflection where the curvature changes, uh, but uh, you actually see there only one inflection point and so, uh, well, you can say that's a pretty good fit. Um, <clears throat> I didn't calculate the, um, uh, the R squared because the R squared tells you the, um, the percentage of the data that are fit by whatever your postulate was. Well, this is just a stupid curve that has no physics. So even if I showed it had a better, it, it fit better than a straight line, it would be totally meaningless because it's not an explanation. It's just a, just a curve there. Okay, that's some real data. <clears throat> now, here are some of the vested interests in this um, uh, global uh, warming scam. Uh, some propaganda. It's the, alignment, uh, the Alliance for Climate Protection has a group called We Can Solve It. And uh, here are their uh, experts. Uh, somebody from NRDC, somebody from Calpine, somebody from Environmental Defense, Blue Green, Blue Green, Blue Green Alliance, Cooler Incorporated, Climate Solutions. These are scientists. <laughs> All right. Then they have a group called Repower America with uh, no known humans in charge. Uh, this is reality, which is another group with no known humans in charge. I mean, you go to the website, there's no reference to anybody, anywhere, okay? There's a group called the Climate Group <coughs> with uh, offices uh, spread out throughout the world from Melbourne to uh, uh, Chicago, California, London, Brussels, Beijing, so forth. And here are some of their uh, members. You probably can't read that. Uh, Austin Energy, Baker and McKenzie, Barclays Bank, it goes on. And that's just A through C. The list goes on and on. There's Earthwatch with offices uh, all over the place. Earthwatch saith, addressing climate change is a major component of environmental responsibility, particularly in an individual behavior, corporate investment and conduct, and government policy. The latter, of course, to, to control all of the earlier stuff. The Union of Confused Scientists says uh, global warming is one of the most serious challenges facing us. Now, it's a curious thing. You see, they have always been fervent anti-nukes. So we're going to get our energy from what? Okay. <clears throat> we can solve it another one of these groups, and uh, uh, here are their solutions, uh, chicken manure, sunbeams, and breezes. 
that's going to solve our energy problem. We get, uh, as Larry said, we get 85% of our energy from fossil fuels. U.S. CAP, uh, United States Climate Action uh, Partnership, is, let us say, generously funded by uh, Alcoa, uh, BP, Caterpillar, Duke, DuPont, Environmental Defense, which will show up again later, PG&E, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. We're talking big money, okay? That's what we are against. <clears throat> and from, uh, there's of course the UN IPCC, which I remind people is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And they're very eager to get their hands on American money. Now in the next picture, I'm gonna show you a photograph of an individual that I know pretty well uh, <clears throat> who has done as much climate research in two years as the United States I, IPCC has done in all of history. <clears throat> that's my grandson. And he has discovered something very, that's very important to climate uh, for the positive feedback models. And what he has discovered, and you watch carefully, is that when water goes up into the air, it stays there. See that? All this time, it, that water hasn't fallen. Believe it or not, that's part of the IPC scheme, that the, you evaporate more water and it stays in the air. Now, <clears throat> the rest of this time is going to be devoted to talking about a propaganda effort. Uh, this is a book written that uh, Larry actually pointed out by Larry David, Laurie David and Gam Cambria Gordon, I think. What I want you to uh, notice is that at the bottom it says scholastic, that means it's Scholastic Press, and it is meant for the kiddies. Now, <clears throat> we have to counter this stuff. It is gonna be about like shooting fish in a barrel, but those fish are damn dangerous. We gotta shoot them, so here we go. Um, here are the authors. Laurie David is a producer of An Inconvenient Truth, a trustee of the NRDC, an author of Stop Global Warming, The Solution, and uh, she is called the Bono or Bono of Climate Change. Watch something happens here. Back and forth. <laughs> okay, and she's, uh, and Cambria Gordon is an ad advertising copywriter and an actor, uh, active environmentalist. These people have written a book for children. It's printed by Scholastic Press and it's gotten into schools. How many schools, I don't know, but lots of them. All right, now in this book, uh, they, they ask these things like, oh, what did these experts have to say? Uh, here we have uh, a football player a singer, an actor, an actress, a comedian, a snowboarder, oh my God, the snow's going away, and a surfer, and an astronaut. Not the one we had yesterday, but he said, when I circle the moon, look back at the earth, blah, 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 the future is up to you, it says absolutely nothing about global warming, but what the heck, you put it there and the kitty says, oh, it's a hero. Now, <clears throat> here's a, this is something, I mean, I just copied these things from the book. CO2 and temperature, they go together like peanut butter and jelly, milk and cookies, macaroni and cheese, you get the picture. Yeah, I do get the picture. Peanut butter causes jelly. And we can forget the big stuff. Here's a graph, where does all this CO2 come from? And uh, it's broken up into transportation, residential, and so forth. Now the humans actually produce about three and a half percent of all CO2 emissions. 96 and a half percent of CO2 emissions are from mama nature. Uh, primarily the oceans, but uh, the plant respiration and so forth. And 25% of the human produced CO2 comes from the US, 
That means that the U.S. is responsible for 1% of the CO2 that enters the air. Now, at this point, I mean, everyone knows that humans are emitting CO2, and everybody knows that the CO2 uh, is increasing in the atmosphere. Now, let me ask a question. Suppose you're, it's cold outside, and you have your thermostat set for whatever our great leader has in the White House now. 82? Well, all right. <laughs> all right, hot enough to grow orchids. Anyway, you have the thermostat set. And then what you do is you turn on some lights, and the lights add heat to the room. Does the room get warmer? No, because the thermostat simply calls for less heat to come from the furnace, okay? So that the fact that you're adding something into a feedback system does not imply that that quantity is actually going to increase. All right, now, this is science according to David and Gordon. Here is this graph, and you notice that there are no numbers over there for the CO2 concentration. There are no numbers there telling us what the, temp what the temperature is, and the graphs are interchanged, as Larry has pointed out. Let me tell you about the first principle of causality. It's a very important principle. The cause has to come before the effect. <laughs> okay? All right, now, the wet sidewalks don't cause rain. Lung cancer does not cause cigarette smoking. Uh, CO2 is a lagging indicator. Here we have a couple of papers from science that show that the uh, temperature changes actually occur before the CO2 changes. Now yesterday I heard a very nice talk about the, uh, the, the ice cores and how we don't really know what the time scale is in these ice cores because of a number of things. But let me explain it to you this way. That I'm not worried about it for this. I think they have a good handle on this. Suppose your time scale is, uh, is, is represented by a slinky, all right? And you've made an error in the time scale of what you thought was 400,000 years is actually 700,000 years. They stretch the scale, okay? Now, it might also be that there are some anomalies in this, that parts of places we've misread things and the slinky is scrunched up a little bit here and stretched out a little bit over there. I don't care about that. Let me tell you why. When they measure the, the CO2 and the temperature, what they're doing is looking at gases. They're getting the uh, O18, the oxygen 18. They're looking at that in a mass spectrometer. They're looking at the carbon dioxide in a mass spectrometer, and they're taking them both from exactly the same slice. All right? So, <clears throat> Whatever it is, you know that at this particular time, uh, the CO2 concentration was such and such, and the O18 concentration was such and such, and the long and short of it is that even if they've got the time scale wrong, the sequence of events is not affected. All right, And if the sequence of events is not affected, then you can tell that A came before B. You may not know exactly how far it came before B, but you do know that A came before B. So I have uh, good reason to believe that the information here, that the, the uh, carbon dioxide uh, occurred after the temperature changes is quite reasonable. Now, here is something, uh, well, okay, one, a couple more things about carbon dioxide. A way of explaining uh, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, 0.038%. Uh, Larry did with four people standing up in a football stadium. Uh, I did this way. I went and got a $100 bill. And you know, by the way, I've been rich three times. I've gone broke more often than that. $100 bill represents the atmosphere. Four cents represents the uh, amount of carbon dioxide in the air. Now we're going to talk a little bit about cause and effect again. This is the uh, curve for solubility 
of carbon dioxide in water. Um, <clears throat> now this is not necessary, this is not in fact ocean water, it's pure water. The curve for ocean water would be uh, similar in shape and so forth, so that quantitatively this may not be quite right, but qualitatively it's right. And if the temperature increases, the solubility decreases, or downcreases as I used to say, and the CO2 leaves the water. All right, that's the cause and effect. So as the earth warms up, okay. Now, here is this curve again, uh, and uh, they are saying that the carbon dioxide changed the temperature. They've got the heart before the course. But it's a very low resolution graph. A thousand years is about the width of a pixel on this graph. And a line width there is 5,000 years. And that graph cannot possibly be used to tell cause from effect whether the curves are interchanged or not. I've got a less than a minute here. Uh, here is the CO2 concentration that is alleged to cause the temperature to rise and fall. If the CO2 caused the temperature to, ch uh, caused the temperature to change, where did the CO2 come from? Wiley Coyote's back pocket? <laughs> they used to pull out all kinds of things, uh, chasing the roadrunner, all made by Acme. Is the cause even present? Okay, I think I'm about approximately out of time, so in fact, I'm out of time, so I will uh, cancel it right there, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you.